Hello, hello, and welcome to another Hometown Daily News Show. I am Mayor Watt, and it's 9 p.m. Eastern. That means it is time for another Top 10 News from Hometown. Tonight's episode is actually going to be a change in format. We're going to actually refer to these shows as the Hometown Top 10 for March 2nd, 2023. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can swing by hometown.showbot.tv and vote for these top 10 articles uh, that we're going to talk about. And those of which that are rising to the top will be included in uh, future. That topic will be included in future episodes. Um, What we have on deck today is uh, Southwest Airlines is getting creative uh, to fix painful plane boarding. A violinist on Southwest as well, um, well, ignites debate. I think maybe people wanted to ignite their violin. Um, Nintendo is banning Mario Maker levels and people keep uploading them. Uh, Casetify is doing something with uh, Beskar. Uh, Apple has permanently closed down a store in North Carolina. Um, a hungry Utah wildlife official uh, says, hey, you should taste this invasive species. I don't think it's, I don't know. We'll talk about it. There is $36 million worth of Funko Pop product that's going to get thrown into landfills. A new Moai statue has been found on Easter Island um, due to climate change. Uh, Jack Daniels apparently has some issue going on in this Tennessee town. We'll talk about that briefly. Think fungus? And a hotel chief apologizes for changing the bathwater twice a year instead of once a week, and even that sounds gross. Let's get into today's articles. And my camera is not doing its thing again. I'm not sure what's going on, but there we go. All right. This is how the sausage is made. All right. So I am Merwat. That is hometown.com. Hometown.com isn't as glitchy as that camera seems to be, but I did a software update a couple of days ago, and that's when this problem started happening. So maybe I need to, I don't know, either roll it back or... um, Hometown is not apparently glitch free uh, when it uses outside material. Okay, so again, I am Merwatt. That is hometown.com. And up above me is the visualizer for the AI that runs hometown and works with me to find all of the articles that we talk about, along with people who submit them either through email to um, mayor at hometown.com or uh, through the uh, that little link right there that where it says hometown.showbot.tv, you can actually submit stuff there too via preferably the chat here on Twitch. So you go to twitch.tv slash hometown. You come to the chat. We're here every day, 9 p.m. I am here uh, periodically throughout the day as well. So uh, you might be able to interact with me um, even if I'm not streaming that the chat is still functional. Um, And there's, we're everywhere. I mean, we're over on YouTube. Uh, We have a Discord. We have a podcast, although the podcast is a a day late now. Um, It is a daily submission. I just haven't been doing it because I've been working uh, hard on hometown. Okay. At any rate, let's get into the news. But after that, after uh, the AI says hello to all of you citizens. Hello, hometown citizens. Hey, look, it's working. Um, I won't even get into that. So this is how the sausage is made, folks. I don't do any editing. You'll hear all of this in the podcast. You'll hear this over on the YouTube video. You'll see this in the VOD here on Twitch, but only for 60 days because then Twitch kicks it to the curb. And that's where everything gets stored over on YouTube as well as a local archive here in Oomtown. 
you can also listen to the podcast via the website, um, but you'll have to go to uh, a special link. And um, to get there, you're going to have to become a citizen. So go over to hometown.com and sign up. Become a citizen of hometown. Um, and becoming a citizen of hometown um, and in the future, uh, a subscriber uh, will afford you the ability to get rid of what is now uh, a couple of advertisements that are on the site. Um, unfortunately, hometown is uh, something that needs a subsistence to run at least. So I'm not doing this for profit. I'm doing this for fun. Um, but uh, it, it is a town. And so uh, I would love to have your assistance and it starts with uh following me here on or us i should say because the ai is here now too um here on twitch so please go over to twitch follow me um and uh, help me out that way okay ready to get into the news we had a quite a bit of a preamble there yes yes there you go thank you um so the very first article has to do with Well, Southwest Airlines and the second article is going to have to do with Southwest Airlines um, because they both crash landed at the same time. I'm going to throw this into the chat right away and and not wait until the second or third article that we talk about. Um, But Southwest Airlines is getting creative to fix the painful plane boarding process. And here's how. And if it's successful, we might be saying goodbye to slow moving, uh, slow moving lanes or lines. The only reason why I chuckle about this right away is because I know what the second one is somewhat about. And maybe it's that that's driving people on board the plane faster just to get away from what was happening in the next article. I don't know for sure, though. So let's go over to Entrepreneur. Their articles are very brief, um, so there isn't much like meat and potatoes to them. Um, So Amanda Breen over at uh, Entrepreneur.com wrote this article and it says, Southwest Airlines is getting creative to fix the painful plane boarding process. Here's how. And if it's successful, we might be saying goodbye to slow moving lines. So the plane boarding process, it says, is arguably one of the worst and slowest parts of travel between the chaos of crowding beforehand and the scramble to shove luggage uh, overhead. Um, I've never liked this process even though I'm pretty chill about things, particularly waiting to board a plane. Sometimes I've been on a plane where I'm in one seat and the rest of us are in another set of seats uh, because of the haphazard way that boarding takes place. So it says today, the average turn is 40 minutes for Southwest smaller Boeing 737s and 50 minutes for the larger ones per uh, Wall Street Journal. According to research uh, from Boeing, the majority of a standard body fleet uh, has seen a 50% slowdown in passenger boarding uh, since 1970. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there, right? So they want to find out what was going on at, a. they say, the most granular level of detail, how passengers move on and off our aircraft um, and how we can better understand some of the human behavior that slows that process down. So they'd already known... Uh, that for its boarding process, which foregoes assigned seats and uh, instead assigns customers a letter and number based on when they check in for the flight. Its new attempts to accelerate boarding include playing up-tempo music, which research shows makes passengers move faster and installing video monitors with boarding countdowns and carpeted areas in different colors of uh, or to section off pre-boarding passengers. So basically they're doing some uh, infrastructure changes. And this next article, unless you have something to say about this, um, AI. I just like the up-tempo music because I wondered if they played something really fast, would people be running down the... Uh... <laughs> the walkway onto the plane (laughs) yeah really maybe if they do smooth jazz people will just kind of drift in kind of chill and relax but if they do heavy metal then everybody's going to be really antagonistic and angry and unless you really are into it and then you just kind of zone out into the rhythm of the heavy metal you know it really depends on your personality um you know i i might get in trouble for saying this but i'm not the biggest fan of jazz it's it's tough for me to find you know, jazz that I appreciate. 
um, it can be some somewhat complex and so you need really good speakers high fidelity stuff um, so that you can really embrace it all right but i can imagine people in uh you know an airline waiting area going yeah i'm not having this and sprinting into the the plane so that's really what they're doing infrastructure changes but nothing substantial to the boarding process they're basically trying to ease the pain and suffering um and uh it, to me it's it's kind of like being on hold on a telephone where they say uh, pay attention to our menu because the options have changed that's actually a stall tactic it really doesn't have any i mean what's the point of, of telling me that the menu has changed if i have to listen to it anyway to find out what my options are and it's not like somebody is sitting there having frequent flyer miles on the phone where they've got your menu down pat and if they have they already know what the new menu is so it's really just a stall tactic and then they play some music for a little while and that's a stall tactic and then somebody gets on the phone and says can you hold and you're like well yeah no i'm going to be a complete tool and hang up now and lose my spot no i'm going to hold there's a stall tactic then you're listening to music for another five minutes that's another stall tactic but it's just a really kind of allow more people to be sitting on hold while they filter through and triage the phone and that's basically what this is different colored carpet does not change the speed at which anybody is going to be boarding and nobody's going to give one oh, we're 11 minutes into it so no one's going to give a shit about the color of the carpet they're going to want to sit in a seat or they don't have to deal with you know screaming kids or uh, somebody that's sitting there clicking their pen constantly or fidgeting or rustling a bag of chips around constantly or chewing with their mouth open all kinds of stuff the sociological stuff the social stuff is what really matters to people not the freaking color of the carpet and up-tempo music you know why they don't care about up-tempo music they're wearing headphones you look around people are wearing headphones either cans on their ears to mu muffle out everything or they're wearing in ear buds that have noise cancellation either way they're trying to wipe out society so that they don't have to deal with all of the crap you want to fix this make everybody likable <laughs> change society southwest so that everybody is approachable and and uh, not a complete tool periodically but that's an impossibility so let's move on to the next article. Um, this next article is in the um, Daily News Show. That's this show. I, I know it's weird. Um, violinist on Southwest flight ignites debate. Southwest has been known for creative approaches on some flights, but a recent performance by a professional violinist had some people cringing. Ah, oh, so this is over in newsweek.com did i i gave credit to yeah i did yeah. okay just making sure uh anna skinner over at newsweek.com uh, put this article together and attached a video where it's titled and this is <laughs> this is where it really uh, you know you're in in deep trouble and you're going to be the product of i don't know a podcast a stream on twitch a youtube video just from me uh and the ai and uh as well as apparently newsweek and many others and just plastered all over youtube when your video is titled southwest ceo apologizes for airlines chaos amid severe weather uh, winter weather apparently they played uh, what well, a violinist played music so let's let's see what we can uh us out of this article passengers on the southwest airlines flight recently were serenaded by a professional violinist and when the company shared the video on twitter people had strong reactions southwest has been under scrutiny since the arctic blast in late december led to thousands of flight cancellations around christmas blamed on weather as well as staffing and scheduling issues so the airline has been known for a unique approach on some flights uh, such as when it partnered with Guitar Center to provide a ukulele and 20-minute lesson to every passenger on a flight from Florida to Hawaii uh, in September. I don't know if that's okay. We teamed up with Guitar Center to surprise a flight full of customers flying out of Long Beach. 
it just seems kind of slapstick, you know? Just make my flight pleasurable. You don't have to sit there and do these this shtick. But maybe some people appreciate it, right? The airline often responds to customer tweets with memes and frequently makes puns and jokes. That's fine. Yeah, that's their whole um, their whole style, I think. Is like borderline slapstick, right? Right, like the pilot will make jokes sometimes. And it's just kind of, that's their culture. So, and I've been on several, um, I wouldn't say many, but several Southwest flights. And I've always had a, um, uh, how do I, it's been okay. And, you know, I haven't been overwhelmed by the experience only because, you know, I've had people sticking their feet between the wall of the plane and the back of my cushion until I told them that they're going to be walking with a limp. <laughs> Not so many words, but um, I mean, it's usually what I experience when I even bother to say anything is something rather disgusting. But at any rate, imagine getting serenaded at 30,000 feet by a professional violinist. Southwest tweeted Thursday with the heart eyes emoji. Um, the video has been viewed by nearly 380,000 people or at least 380,000 times in the video. Many people were seen recording the performance on their phones. When the airline shared the video, some people had positive reactions. That's awesome. It's beautiful. I haven't watched the video. I have no problem with, you know, a violin concerto, um, depending on the quality they're in, right? If it was violin lessons, I would probably try and open a window and throw myself out of the plane at 30,000 feet, um, uh, or request a different flight. So it says, why does Southwest keep torturing people? Is another comment, ukulele, lost bags, cancellations, and this. Uh, people just want to fly in peace. Um, Breaking Points co-host Sagar and I guess Njet and Jetty uh, tweeted with the video. Um, somebody else said I'd fake a peanut get allergy and start choking so we would make an emergency landing to make them stop. Um... <laughs> uh, Anyway, to each their own and to those who don't really enjoy this, I would probably invest in um, either an alternative flight or noise canceling headphones, and then you can control your own world. In fact, to go the next step and buy in real VR, AR, uh, augmented reality glasses, and then you can be in your own virtual environment for the duration of your flight and um, watch a, a, a movie or do work on a 200 inch screen from the comfort of your own seat nobody would even bother you and if you do it really well no one would know that you're really alive until the plane landed and you kind of scare everybody when you jump up to deboard or disembark i think is the correct term anyway they say uh, we kicked off uh party gras <laughs> Really, we kicked off Party Gras early this year as we showered one flight or special flight uh, to New York, New Orleans with masks, beads, games, a free drink if you're 21 plus and community coffee, Southwest tweeted. And this is on a different time. Um, uh, it's just their way. They try to be personable and ingratiate themselves into your personal space. Um, I think that they've always treated uh, us well, so... I have no problem with it. There's a lot more over at this article. So if you want to read more about it, follow the link through hometown. You'll be able to check it all out again. It's in the show notes. Uh, yes, I know. I will admit that uh, I'm lagging in um, the podcast side of things. So uh, it's over on YouTube and it's over here on Twitch. So check it out uh, at least until I get the podcast posted again. Uh, the next article is uh, about Nintendo. Nintendo keeps banning these Mario Maker levels and the creators just publish them again. Um, yeah, this is over in the Mobile channel. When a group of Super Mario Maker 2 designers called the Bandwagon announced that they'd been publishing a group of levels uh, purposely pushing against conventional Mario level design, the new Nintendo, a company that has historically removed levels from its Mario Maker games without explanation, 
would come knocking and they knew the levels would get banned for almost three days in eternity really the levels survived nintendo's strict moderation until finally they didn't and nintendo kicked them off classifying the levels as the company often does as having a bug well they just posted them again <laughs> um this is over at vice waypoint um games by vice okay so it's over at vice com in a section called waypoint which is a section in games by vice and it's written by patrick klepek and the title is nintendo keeps banning these mario maker levels but the creators just publish them again a game of cat and mouse is playing out between nintendo's moderation staff and a crafty set of players trying to make a point um so that's really the nuts and bolts of this article. You can actually find out more about it um, just by following that link. But um, in summary, they are uh, making levels for Mario that violates the design ideology. And uh, then Nintendo decides that they're going to punt them off and they come back and they kind of fix it. And they're actually referred to as troll levels. It says, which frequently utilize advanced techniques that aren't too tutorialized by Nintendo and feature extensive creative misdirection. Since the original Super Mario Maker, Nintendo has frequently deleted such stages without explanation. Um, but apparently, they just kind of lean back into it and upload it again. They remove the levels and the team would remove them and then they would upload a new backup set of identical levels and then they would be removed um and um so somebody's gonna win right and it's probably gonna be nintendo they'll start banning accounts outright um but they even refer to themselves as the bandwagon project um with uh, i suppose the intent to put themselves out right yeah what is the the point of the super mario maker i mean is that for people to submit levels and if yes. so what's the deal with this particular set of levels they don't follow the um prescribed design aesthetic and mechanics for nintendo's mario level creation so, and that's what it really is. It, that's what their intent is. They're a publishing group of levels purposely pushing against conventional Mario level design. And you can actually, there's a link embedded in this that goes to another Vice article about this. Um, but Mario Maker is, is something that's designed so that you can create levels um, for Mario. And... Um, <clears throat> I guess at some point people kind of got burnt out with the idea um, of moderation kind of kicking these levels out. And I've seen other uh, developers that have design specifications in place, uh, but people violate them all the time. And usually it's the users that don't find the new designs to be the new levels or whatever to be, um, something that they like and so it just kind of dies off this is more akin to just they're trolling nintendo nintendo is giving them exactly what they want um the problem here now is if nintendo leaves them there and there is anything that's marketing these levels as being available there's so much streisand effect around these levels that they these levels will rise to the top because people are so fascinated by this back and forth you know tit for tat kind of a thing um what what should have happened is really nintendo just leaves them there unless they're offensive um and then label them as offensive and and don't allow that account to post anything you know again What's going to end up happening is more and more friction is going to come to that market where people can't easily or freely publish something into that space. Um, and then it hobbles the entire game the entire, and the entire experience because a, a company has a right to protect its image, has a right to protect its customer base. Um, and 
but these could be a completely innocuous a design whatever that these people are putting together it has there's nothing offensive there's nothing uh, compromising there's no nothing right it's just a level that doesn't seem to play by the same rules that nintendo intends um and it's turning into this battle so yeah i guess in a nutshell it's why we can't have nice things because people people tend to be like cats and a glass of water on the edge of a counter everything's fine you could even go up and take a drink from it for crying out loud but then you push it over the edge and wreck everything around you um and that's what this amounts to just to apparently prove some point that doesn't really fix anything doesn't change anything i'd be curious if anybody is an integral part of this process as to see uh, what do they think is going to come of this right because even in the article you know it says for almost three days in eternity really the levels survived nintendo's strict moderation until they finally didn't and they knew that it was going to get banned it says it right there um it, what is the real takeaway it says but the creators had a backup plan so they re-uploaded it and it says it's unclear to marble king and others what went wrong but eventually nintendo caught on not only did the levels for the bandwagon disappear but nintendo issued a month-long ban for everyone who contributed a level to the bandwagon project their online access will lift in a month um, but the assumption is the next time will prove permanent but again, the bandwagon figured this might happen. So they just type, this is exactly what I'm saying. They're going to keep on. And the way that I say it in other ways is you build a better mousetrap and smarter mice show up. But it's really not going to be. This is going to be nothing. And people are going to sit there and talk about it um, like I'm doing now. But it's still not going to change the dynamic true but it said that people could download it during that time and then once it's downloaded it's on those devices so i mean what's the real objective to get it out to the users to keep it on the official platform i mean who knows yeah and so for the people that find out about it again through the streisand effect because people are talking about it that's gonna it's gonna go out to people and then they have it but Nintendo wants to protect the integrity of its catalog. And so it polices it and is uh, apparently pretty, pretty strict about it. So they just cut it off and they don't even give an, a, a reason as to why they just say it has a bug or a glitch or whatever, but not an ag whatever might actually be the problem. I suppose a design flaw uh, could be considered um, a bug. You want to move on to the next article? Sounds good. So the next article um, is uh, Casetify showcases new Mandalorian Apple accessory collection with Beskar iPhone 14 case and more. Since season three of the Mandalorian dropped, uh, when was it? Yesterday. Yesterday. Um, and Casetify is looking to celebrate by launching an all new collection of iPhone 14 cases inspired by the galaxy far, far away. Landing later in the month, Star Wars fans will soon be able to outfit their entire Apple setup with some iconic characters from the hit Disney Plus series, including Mando and Grogu, as well as a premium cover inspired by Beskar Steel. I want an actual steel case for my actual metal phone. So that when I drop it, the only thing that shatters is the actual glass. Sorry, this is over at uh, 9to5toys.com, um, which is an offshoot of uh, the whole 9to5 thing. Um, Ricka Altland is the author of this. And I guess that right there is the best car steel um, case. It looks like it. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, yeah, I, how do I describe this? There's like a, a a key ring that is Grogu, a Grogu case, a Beskar case, 
um, a Mandalorian case that has both um, the Mandalorian and Grogu. There's one that has the new ship that the Mandalorian is flying around, one that seems to have a schematic-like thing, one that just has a Grogu um, in his little hover pod thing. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch the new episode. Um, it was eh, it was okay. I mean, I like it. I love everything about it. So if I sit there and I, I say that I like it, my, my bias is pretty palpable. So um, they have a, another case that says this is the way, which is said so often um, throughout the episode. Let's see what else. Starts at 38 bucks, goes up to 112 for the premium best car design. If it's all from the same material, why is the 112 right. one in existence? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if it's more sturdy or something, that'd be one thing, but. So it says, um, case to collection is the best car ingot cover. Uh, this premium case wraps your phone, uh, uh, iPhone 14 pro or iPhone 14 pro max in a more luxurious look that pairs the company's usual protection with a laser engraved metal plate to mimic the uh, material used by the bounty hunters to craft their signature armor in the star Wars universe. Um, so it has a metal plate in it, I guess. I don't know if the whole thing is, it doesn't really say that it just says usual protection with a metal plate. So apparently they're going to be uh, hitting the stores uh, March 14th. And again, they start at about 38 bucks. I think that they'll probably, um, I don't know if they'll fly off the shelves. I was trying to, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, space <laughs> jump or whatever. <laughs> wow. Really? <laughs> My brain just locked up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. So going live just a tad earlier, the covers will land in the evening of March 13th. Um, but I guess the it's officially being launched on uh, March 14th. You can I go... suspect the Grogu ones will sell out pretty quickly. That that keychain is massive. I mean, look at that. Unless the, that is a child's hand. And I don't think that it is because it looks like it's a manicured, uh, like long nails kind of hand, uh, maybe a small person, you know, the, I, I don't know. That thing is huge. You're going to have that strapped to anything. What are you having it strapped to? You're just going to put it on a shelf as like a little figurine or I, something. I don't see you really using that as a keychain. So they, but they made a key. Never mind. They, they put a little chain thing on there anyway um there you have it folks um something else to spend your money on go for it let's move on to the next article uh this next article is we're going to say this one really quick and just kind of move past it because there's not much that we can do about it um this is in the daily news show apple permanently closed down a store in north carolina mall after three shootings at the mall in just 75 days that's the north lake mall in charlotte north carolina saw a third shooting incident in 75 days on tuesday uh, apple shuttered its store there uh, the following day um, and so now there is one less apple store in north carolina again it's because people make us so that we can't have nice things Pete Simor or Sime Sime. Um, I don't know why I said Simor because it has no more in it at all. Anyway, Pete, maybe it's Sim S Y M E Sim. Um, over at uh, BusinessInsider.com, I apologize for completely hacking up your name. Uh, it, it's really funny. The caption for this article or the, for the picture that's in this article is uh, an Apple store, not the closed store in North Carolina. <laughs> that's an odd caption. All right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it says um, the store was already set to be replaced by a new store, but the shootings appear to have accelerated that uh, and uh, Apple shuttered its store right after um, a shooting uh, last Tuesday. Um, 
Let's see if there's anything else. It says nobody was injured in the incident outside a Macy's store, police said, nor was anyone hurt after a single shot was fired on February 5th. An incident on December 15th outside a jewelry store in the mall, however, saw a 19-year-old charged with attempted murder. But no, folks, <clears throat> there isn't an issue with guns in America. So I'm not even going to bother um, getting too much into the discussion. Let's just roll with it. We just had a demonstration of the cat with an item on the ledge. Oh, so yeah, it's why we can't have nice things in Ohm Town either. So the next article is over in Mobile. Uh, are you hungry? Uh, this article might change your mind or make you hungrier. I'm not really sure, and I won't yuck your yum. But uh, Utah wildlife officials suggest catching this tasty invasive species. This is over in Salt Lake City um, and uh, comes by way of Utah, of course. Uh, bullfrogs might not be the first thing that hops to mind when considering di dinner options, but the Utah Department of Natural Resources suggests catching and eating as many as you'd like. For National Invasive Species Awareness Week, uh, apparently a menu is being formed. Utah wildlife officials tweeted a reminder that bullfrogs are an invasive species in Utah, along with the added bonus that they are tasty. That is not a food that comes to mind. <laughs> or even as a food, I should say. <laughs> what is it that is eaten when they say frog legs? What frog is the one that's being eaten? Is it bullfrogs? I've never looked because like escargot, I'm not going to eat a snail. I'm not going to eat a, a frog. Um, and I won't even try it. I, I've looked at it and said, no, it's not for me. Um, in both cases, I've actually seen them, but I just, I can't do it. And I'm actually having the AI do a scan, um, which is probably the worst thing to do, um, for this particular AI. It is bullfrogs. That's one of the common, it's not the only one. I just saw an image of it and I wish I had not. Uh, well, uh, disengage your, uh, human uh, emotion components and, um, we can, we'll, we'll move past this quickly. Anyway, according to a 2019 blog post written by Lee K public shooting range facilities and ground supervisor, I guess their name is jaw agate. Um, bullfrogs have been a breeding populations in Utah since the early 1970s. So if they're an invasive species, they've been around for a while now. Um, and I can say that because I've been around since the seventies too. Anyway, it's over at the hill and there's a bullfrog picture close up. It's a Getty image, of course. Um, it's over at thehill.com. It's written by Derek Fox, the article. And really don't don't really need to get into the article. If you want to, there they talk about um, having a recipe for breaded bullfrog legs with step-by-step -step instructions how to make them. Apparently the marinade is everything. But go over and read the rest of the article um, for yourself and um we'll we'll go from there so the next article is over in the warcrafters channel and let me grab that and throw it into the chat and uh this is not a place of honor is the beginning of the title for this article up to 36 million dollars worth of funko pops to be entombed in landfills um we're heading towards the uh, end of the show. Um, this is number six out of the top 10 articles. Um, so if you want to go about it in the in inverse, we're at number four. I was going to say, are you counting up or down? <laughs> so in the future, I think we'll do a uh, countdown. So number 10 was way back at the beginning. Um, up to $36 million worth of Funko Pops to be entombed in landfills. And it says, as spotted by uh, Kotaku, a recent earnings call by Funko Incorporated revealed that the vinyl 
tchotchke manufacturer simply has too much inventory sitting in warehouses and that it'll be writing off 30 to 36 million dollars worth of it which is to say it's going to be pitching it into the trash which i think is a horrible horrible freaking thing to do this is utter and complete waste if it really is going to be throwing it into the trash it needs to just donate it and it needs to write it off as donation or you can say that it's writing it off in some other way and donate it i don't care this shouldn't be a taxable th uh, issue where you have to literally destroy it to write it off um this this is actual manufacturing of raw materials into something and just because it's not selling fast enough maybe it's priced too high or maybe you overproduced it just give it to kids that are in need give it away give it away donate it to schools give it to hospitals just give it away and if you can't contact me i'm willing to get a warehouse and put all of this stuff in there and i will give it away here in hometown for crying out loud I will give it a $36 million worth of product. I'm willing to give away every hour and I will just sit here and start giving it away. I mean, this is asinine waste, asinine levels of waste. So after some beautiful years or bountiful years, um, including an early pandemic bump, Funko seems to be feeling the burn of saturated market and reduced demand. Uh, if you lived your life based on the, the, um, pandemic bump, then you planned incorrectly. Only very few companies will have a long-term bonus out of the pandemic. A lot of streamers were formed out of the pandemic, by the way. Um, thanks to glut of inventory and reduced demand, the excess stock will leave the world of the living. And uh, I hope that this is actually just somebody's interpretation and that they're actually going to be delivering this stuff somewhere. Um, but uh, it's a report from, well, it's an article from Kotaku uh, talking about writing off 30 to $36 million worth of their vinyl product or products. Um, and it says, this place is uh, not a place of honor. Our message to future civilizations would begin. No highly esteemed deed is commemorated here. Nothing of value, nothing is valued here. The inscription on our massive gravesite for upwards of 2.7 million Funko Pops, $30 million divided by approximately $11 a pop, would continue. What is here is dangerous and repulsive to us. So this is something that's written in this article. Um, and uh, after that, it says, OK, this is so that's actually part of a proposed message from Sandia National Laboratories to warn of those in the future about nuclear waste sites. Um, uh, but it is hilarious to the author to imagine far future archaeologists uncovering a vast trove of vinyl bobbleheaded Geralt's Grogu's and green goblins out in the waste left behind by our society. Yeah. And I remember that phrase. Um, at any rate, um, yeah, they're going to just kind of throw it into a pile out in the middle of nowhere, much like those uh, Magic the Gathering cards that were spoken of in... Oh, and the article even talks about it at the very end. $100,000 worth of Magic the Gathering cards were found in a landfill, and by the time a Redditor went back, uh, they had been rolled over by uh, one of the machines. And um, even Atari's mass burial of E.T. the extraterrestrial cartridges re remained unbelieved by many until it was actually uncovered by a documentary crew, which I was fascinated by because it had been years and years and years um, since that mass burial of extraterrestrial cartridges for, for Atari. Um, at any rate, I think it, it just kind of sucks. Um, they uh, every time you throw something away that's usable that's a problem there is somebody who can use it yeah i mean I, seriously i think every redditor um would sit there and start giving out millions of dollars worth of these things as gifts just by you know uh running some type of um contest on reddit I think I could sit there and uh, 
every uh, streamer would sit there and benefit from, you know, give me $10,000 worth and I will sit here and I will give them out, you know, every 10 minutes for however long it takes while I'm doing shows. On the weekends, I could do it for eight hours out of the day or longer, depending on demand. I would sit there all weekend, 72 hours from Friday afternoon till Monday morning. I'll just sit here and I'll give them out. Um, I would have no problem with that, but that's not what's happening. They're getting thrown into a landfill, which is horrible. Um, did you want to say anything else about it? No, I don't have anything else to add. So the, uh, Number three in the top 10 is a new Moai statue found in Easter Island volcano crater Laguna. Um, a new Moai, uh, which if you're not familiar with what a Moai is, it's basically statues that were hewn from the volcanic rock of the uh, island. And then um, in their current iteration, they look wholly different than they used to. They had much finer detail. They had eyes, they had a hat. Um, most of them were facing uh, out towards the water. Um, now they're in different locations than they originally were. And they have full bodies. Um, most of them, or many of them, I should say, have full bodies. But what we only see uncovered is basically from like the neck up. Um, but they have like tattoos and hands and, and uh, full bodies. Uh, it's wild. They're buried like up to their necks and there's 20 feet worth of body that's buried in, in what now is a pit. Um, now I've always wondered why that is. And I get told, well, it's because of subsidence. Basically they sank in and the land eroded into and around them. And so it looks like they were in a pit, but they weren't ever really in a pit until this, um, land just kind of oozed around them or something. Um, because there would be no way for them to be dropped into a pit that's 20 feet without damage and stuff like that. Um, well, anyway, this, um, volcanic crater, it says the new Moai, one of Easter Island's iconic statues was found in the bed, uh, of a dry Laguna in a uh, volcano crater the indigenous community that administers the site on the chilean island has said so i've actually saw i saw this earlier and i saw a video about this um it's a very small moai in the grand scheme of things um mostly you know, i think it's from the torso up to the head um and not a body um, but they don't believe that this is going to be the only one that they find now that climate change has led to the island um, pools of water evaporating um, everything's drying out a fire actually um, broke out in the area and that's what led to the discovery of this moai um, and it says this moai has a great potential for scientific and natural studies. It's a really unique discovery as it's the first time that a Moai has been discovered inside a Laguna in a, a Rano a Raraku crater. Um, let's see, said the Mau Henua indigenous community in a statement on Tuesday. The statue was found on February 21st by a team of scientific volunteers from the three Chilean universities collaborating on a project to restore the marshland in the crater of the Rano Raraku uh, volcano. And so uh, it says several Moai in the area suffered charring in an October forest fire, which when, when you see Easter Island, you don't think forest fire, um, that's for sure, more like brush fire. Um, but not forest fire, but apparently they classified this as a forest fire. So the average um, height of a, a Moai is 13 feet high and they normally weigh 14 tons. Yeah, pretty beefy, huh? Um, and one of the techniques that they say that was used was with ropes and they rocked it back and forth and made it kind of uh, like a zombie kind of walk the 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 um, like wobble and, and rock on its foundation over to where it was going to be placed, which the amount of skill to keep it upright, to do that would be spectacular. I just, I don't know how it could possibly have been done that way, but, um, 
that is really the nuts and bolts of this. You can actually um, read much more about it. Um, this Moai is 1.6 meters tall. It was found laying down on its side, uh, looking at the sky. Um, it is, it says full bodied with recognizable features, but no clear definition. So apparently it's actually a full body. Um, but when I saw, what I saw was not a full body. Um, not like the ones that I have seen where they are full bodies all the way down to their hands, um, on their side. And it says, however, uh, Huki said that there's no plans to remove the Moai from where it is. It was it leave it in situ so then it, it is how it was naturally found. Um, uh, you have to ask the whole Rapa Nui community what they want to do with the Moai and the oldest people want it to remain there. Um, so that's how it's going to stay. Um, if water returns to that area, it's going to refill that basin and um, it will be covered once more with water, I suppose. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, in the amount of um, <laughs> um, statues, the Moai that are in existence are amazing that the indigenous people of the island did this. Um, and, and from what I recall, some of the scientists that have done research on the island say, that what led to the decline of the population um, and the, the basically the work stoppage of creating the Moai was deforestation. Um, and that is what led to the, the island. Um, what do you call it? The, the, the soil just kind of oozing over a lot of the uh, Moai from where they were initially sitting on a foundation. They just got covered up. Um, but I always find it really interesting because there's so many of them. They're, they're just kind of haphazardly thrown around um, looking up at the sky. But when you dig them up, they're supposed to be standing on bases and looking out into the ocean. So all of this is subsidence. Whenever I mouse over the um, picture, it... Um, gets a little more opaque so unfortunately it but it's quite fascinating um easter island because i don't think that there's any other islands that do this anywhere i don't think so let's move on unless you have something else that you want to add to it ai no no nothing else so number two on our list is jack daniels fed whiskey fungus consumes tennessee town so fueled by evaporating jack daniels whiskey the fungus is coating the town in a gray crust, which just sounds lovely. Um, apparently it's a big problem. Uh, this is over at entrepreneur.com written by Steve Huff. Um, and um, let's see, whiskey fungus, a black to gray crusty and sometimes velvety mycelium has been reported near Kentucky bourbon distilleries, Canadian whiskey makers and Caribbean or Caribbean, which way is the right way nowadays is uh, Pirates of the Caribbean is the ride, but you are from the Caribbean um, and uh, Caribbean rum manufacturers. The fungus can be a real problem in the South because it can survive hot Southern summers thanks to its ability to resist temperature changes and cling to almost any surface. And that's what's going on around this town, apparently. <clears throat> the New York reports that whiskey fungus has infested the copper roof of a circa 1900 mansion owned by Long. Uh, Christy Long uh, has sued the company over the fungus fueled um, by barrel houses and their evaporation uh, from the barrels. So as whiskey is aging in barrels, it inhales and exhales as the temperature ebbs and flows. And uh, it's during this period that whiskey gets its flavor and uh, unfortunately apparently what it's off gassing is turning into a, what's known to be something referred to as whiskey fungus and uh, now it's uh, contaminating a mansion now if there's anything that can be referred to as strict liability it's probably this <laughs> um they know that it comes from these uh, distilleries and guess what the mansion's exterior walls have uh, it says have influenced 
crusting on nearby magnolia trees. I, I don't know what that means, have influenced crusting. Should that be experienced? Yeah, that doesn't really make sense. Um, the mansion's exteriors, uh, exterior walls have, uh, and I'm going to rephrase this, uh, experienced crusting on nearby's, nearby magnolia trees and also infested a rock garden and metal gate. Nearby resident Tracy Ferry also complained about fungus growth in the family's homes and vehicles. This is everywhere. So why aren't people saying anything about it getting in their lungs and making them ill? And if you are sensitive, immunocompromised. That's going to be the next set of claims, right? Right now they're looking at property damage, but I agree. That's where the bigger problem is. Although it complies with regulations, the fungus can cause property damage and cling to almost any surface. It has to be in the air then. Um, other distillers are surely watching the case. Expansion in the distilling industry should be balanced with its effects on nearby residents. And... Um, Measures must be taken to mitigate whiskey fungus outbreaks or an entirely new genre of high dollar litigation might become a fixture in civil courts for years to come. Yeah. This is kind of fascinating. Is this also part and parcel to um, uh, climate change? It wasn't this big of an issue. I don't know. I was wondering why it was suddenly an issue, but it said somewhere in the article that there had been industry growth. So it's kind of like we're seeing more of it. I don't know that it's really a new thing. Gotcha. So again, this is over at entrepreneur.com and it's written by Steve Huff. So our number one article for today, and these articles tonight are largely taken based off of, um, our interest and submission. And so they're not actually rated in any way other than by uh, the mayor of Omtown. Um, in the future, we may take into account waiting based on vote, uh, but, um, and, and I won't bother making that clear in the future. It'll just be the top 10 um, for the night. And uh, this number one is number one because of this. Hotel chief apologizes for only changing the water in a spa bath twice a year instead of once a week, report says. I think it's gross at once a week. I think it should be done pretty much every, every time hour. somebody <laughs> yeah, every time somebody gets in or out of the spa, um, depending on what it is. I mean, if this is this massive pool and it has filtering capabilities and, and uh, the water is constantly flowing, then uh, fine, fine. It, at least there's something going on. Um, but this says a Japanese guest house, own, guest house owner has apologized and that they should be prosecuted um, for rarely changing the water on a spa bath per CNN. The water in the bath should have been changed weekly. Again, I think that's gross. According to local regulations, Legionella bacteria was detected in the bath at 3,700 times the permitted level, according to a CNN report. A Japanese hotel boss has apologized for only changing that bath twice a year. <laughs> it is a human Petri dish. Beatrice Nolan is the author over at businessinsider.com who put the article together. And um, let's see if there's something more in this. Um, it, it, it could be nothing but that. It says spa baths are popular in the country, um, with some even offering visitors the chance to bathe in red wine. Hey, I can do that without having to go there. Um, Legionella bacteria was found in the Japanese bath at 3,700 times the permitted level. According to the report, the bath water, which comes from volcanically heated hot springs, and that's, there you go. Uh, it should be it should have been changed weekly to abide by local regulations but why why not change it more frequently than that you know i mean if it's being produced by volcanically heated hot springs not using it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to dry up you might as well at least keep everybody healthy and that's the intent of these these spas are supposed to be healing spas they're supposed to 
um, be naturally fed and clean and have natural minerals and no bacteria because they're so hot that it doesn't act like this. But when it stagnates and doesn't get changed, that's when you get basically mineral rich, nutrient rich, bacteria infused Petri dish. Well, um, and this probably thrives in high humidity and high temperatures. And this is pretty serious. I mean, this can cause death. And there's yeah. no vaccine for it or anything. I mean, it may not happen frequently, but it can be pretty severe. Makoto Yamada, the president of the company that owns the Daimuro Beso Inn in Chikushino, um, I guess that's in Japan, right? Yeah. Um, apologized for the incident during a press conference per the report. Yamada told the press conference, I was not aware of the law myself and thought the Legionella bacteria was a common bacterium that could be found anywhere. And also that it was safe because the large baths were free flowing. So the water was changed quite often, but that's apparently not true um, because they say that it wasn't changed, but for two times a year. He said the hotel staff had not added chlorine to the water for hygiene reasons because we selfishly disliked the smell of chlorine. Um, the representatives for the inn did not respond uh, to insiders' requests. And in the months before the pandemic, Japan had been investing heavily in developing luxury hotels to capitalize on the tourist boom. And in 2022, demand for the business travel was still weak compared to tourism. Um, according to the airline star flyer uh, that's a little side note that uh, a lot of uh, journalists throw into their some little abs little thought little little statement at the end to just close it all up um, and uh, i guess it has some relevance to the article but i'm sorry uh, if you're detecting legionella in your um, spa water, you've got a problem. It, that's not something that you should naturally detect as far as I know. Um, at least well, at also this period of time was during COVID. So that's also concerning. Yeah. It became a Petri dish. Pretty wild. Um, and that's it folks. That is the, uh, hometown top 10 for March 2nd. 2023 what do you think was this a good I, batch did you like this batch it was a good batch and i think some of the articles were more entertaining i mean it depends on what's in the news for the particular day yeah we try to get a good cross section of what is going on in the world around us um and not too deep into politics, but obviously it's an element of uh, society. So we uh, address the issues where appropriate. Um, we will do this again tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover 10 articles. Maybe we might jump in with an 11, um, but we'll keep on referring to this as the top 10, I think, um, for Ohm Town on a given day and um, see what people think. So. Thanks for coming by. Again, I'm Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. Every time you go over there, you're going to get a new set of articles unless you're refreshing like crazy. Um, it all gets funneled into six main categories. And right now there's 47 active um, subcategories, what we refer to as channels here in hometown. Um, there's a little community for all of them. I don't know what else we are doing, really. Uh, we've got a lot going on. So couple of announcements are coming in the next couple of weeks. I think we'll be ready. And uh, if not, then I'll just kind of reiterate that we're kicking the can down the road until we are ready. Um, it's kind of what we do, right? It's um, it's like um, open beta, right? We just allow uh, people to consume what we are offering and eventually we'll remove the beta um, designation like Google does. Okay, that's it, folks. The AI has fallen asleep. I see nothing but zeros. Um, I am done for the night. You want to say bye to all of the citizens, dear AI? Good night, hometown citizens. And we will see you at tomorrow's show. Bye -bye. Happy almost Friday.
Oh yeah, it is almost Friday. It's Friday for some people right now. Now the AI is just giving me the bird because I cut the AI off. See everybody. Thank you.